Hi everyone, this week we're going to be exploring stitching technology. Different kinds of stitches and seams have important implications on production management. Firstly, they determine the style of a finished garment. Secondly, the complexity of different stitching techniques have cost implications, so these should be factored in when making design decisions. Let's look first at what stitches and seams are. A stitch is defined as the interlacing of sewing thread to join fabric together. A seam is the line where two or more fabrics are joined. Stitching refers to a series of stitches, such as for decorative effects or edge finishing. Different kinds of stitches are classified according to their structure and the method they use to interlace the sewing thread. They offer different aesthetic and performance properties according to their size, tension and consistency, for example. Stitches vary according to three different dimensions, their length, width and depth. The length is measured in SPIs, stitches per inch, or SPCs, stitches per centimetre. A high SPI means short stitches, resulting in a stronger, better quality formation. However, the higher the SPI, the more thread used and the higher the cost. A high SPI can also pucker seams, which weakens fabric. Stitch width is the distance between the outermost lines of stitches, and depth is the distance between the upper and lower surface of the stitch. Let's look first at the most common stitch type, the lock stitch. This is the basic stitch found on traditional home sewing machines and forms a continuous row of plain straight stitches. A lock stitch is created by needle thread passing through the material and interlocking with a bobbin thread, as shown in the image here. When the lock stitch is selected for use, the desired SPI needs to be specified. This stitch is secure and will not unravel if the stitch line is cut. However, because of the high labour costs associated with the frequent bobbin changes required, it is a relatively costly stitch type. Another disadvantage is its lack of stretch and the potential for breakage if used on stretchy fabrics. Industrial lock stitch machines with two needles, each forming an independent lock stitch with their own bobbin, are also very common. The chain stitch appears to be the same as the lock stitch from the face of a garment, but has a series of loops on the back. It's formed by a needle thread passing through the material and interlooping with itself on the underside of the seam. A chain stitch is less likely than a lock stitch to cause seam pucker and is able to withstand stretching. It costs less to produce, but is more easily unravelled if the stitch line is cut. A cover stitch is formed by two needle threads passing through fabric and interlooping with one looper thread, with the stitch set on the underside of the seam. On the garment face, it appears as two rows of straight stitches, but underneath, the interlooping threads create a comfortable and durable hem or seam. In order to create the perfect stitch, its upper and lower tensions must be balanced to give the right amount of elasticity. Sewing machines generally have adjustable tension settings. A perfect stitch will have threads locked midway between the two layers of fabric with no loops or puckers. Now we're going to move on to the result of stitch formations, seams. As we've seen, a seam is defined as a line where two or more fabrics are joined. There are two main uses for seams in garment construction. Structural seams join sections of a garment together, such as arms to a t-shirt, and are visible from inside the garment. Enclosed seams finish face sections of a garment and are concealed between the two layers of fabric. These are used in cuffs, waistbands and hems. Let's look at some of the most common types of seams. A superimposed seam is among those most commonly used and is when two or more pieces of material are joined together near an edge with one or more rows of stitching. A lapped seam is made with two or more pieces of fabric overlapping each other. Bound seams are formed by folding a binding strip over the edge of the piles of material and joining both edges of the binding to the material. This produces a neat edge on an exposed seam. A flat seam is made when two fabric edges are brought together 
and oversewn with a cover stitch, as is the case with wetsuits, or with a zigzag, as in underwear. A felled seam is a type of lapped seam and can be identified by the folded edges on both the front and back of the seam as seen on jeans. It also features the same number of rows of stitches on front and back. Mock flat felled seams are plain seams that are pressed to one side and top stitched. You'll see more rows of stitching on the back of a mock flat felled seam than on the face. True flat felled seams are more durable than mock flat but not necessarily more costly. Seams can either join two sections of fabric that are equal lengths or two sections that are different lengths. Joining equal lengths of fabric can be achieved through straight, curved or corner seams. Unequal lengths of fabric can create design features in a garment. The compression of one length of fabric can be achieved through gathering, pleating or tucking and fullness can be introduced such as in a gathered sleeve. So as you've seen, stitch and seam choices can dictate both the design and quality of a final piece of clothing as well as the costs of production and are therefore another important component of the production process. Let's recap on what we've learned in this video. We've covered some of the most commonly used stitch formations and their advantages and disadvantages. We've also looked at different types of seams and how these are used in garment construction. We've seen how stitch and seam choices dictate the overall quality and style of a garment. They also affect production costs, so are an important consideration for a product developer when costing a garment. So that's all for this lesson. Thanks for watching.